would you rather have the ability to read each other's minds or have the power to always know which other person's mind? I don't want to read his mind. <laughs> I would I would give anything to read her mind. <laughs> Um, so probably the latter, but I don't really want to do the latter either. What was the second one? Oh, no, we don't lie. No, he's lying. I pretty much know when he's <laughs> lying already. <laughs> What's the most embarrassing thing you caught Ross doing when you thought no one was watching? Oh. When he pulls off his toenail, chews it, and then uses it to clean his ear. <laughs> And then choose that. Oh, don't chew that. That's like right up there. <laughs> and then you'll say, Do you want to kiss me? Like, you are a repulsive human being. <laughs> Hence why I would start by cutting his toenails. Uh. If you were both stranded on a desert island, which three items would your partner bring, no matter how impractical you were first A hairbrush? Oh, she would bring lots of face cream. <laughs> Ross would just bring two, a surfboard and a bible. Doesn't need anything else. For life, in general. Would you rather have date nights every night of the week, but never go on vacation, or go on an extravagant vacation once a year, but never have date nights? Extravagant vacation. Oh, date night. Would you rather You hate a... date night. I know, but imagine the implications of not having date night. What, no sex? Exactly. <laughs> I don't think that was the question, but that's fine. <laughs> On date nights, would you prefer to have sex before you go out or when you get back right now? Can I ask for us? <laughs> before? And after. <laughs> and after. <laughs> would you rather always have to share the same toothbrush? Will never be able to share any personal hygiene. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> Ross already uses my toothbrush. It's, it's disgusting. <laughs> Can you see where my body language is done? First there was I'm just like he's so repulsive. Would you rather have sex four times a week and never have to unpack the dishwasher? <laughs> this is amazing. Or have sex less than four times a week, but still have to unpack the dishwasher. Less than four times and still have to unpack the dishwasher. <laughs> I can't do the dishwasher. <laughs> First one is who is more likely to get lost in a new city without a map or GPS? Me. Ross gets lost in the current city without a city. <laughs> Who is better at remembering important dates, such as anniversaries or birthdays? I'm rolling for Hey, life groups. We are so pumped for Love Handles coming up, where we will deal with everything from how you handle the dude when he steals all your blankets, to how you deal with her when she squeezes the toothpaste from the top and not the bottom. We will talk about dating, singleness, the whole vibe. It's going to be a jewel. And so if you have any friends who you've been wanting to bring to church, this is the time. But today we're kind of responding to a bit of a God word and something that's happened in the last two weeks. We, in two weeks ago, we spoke about faith from Hebrews 11. And this last week we spoke about our hearts and giving our hearts completely to Jesus and taking all of Jesus into our hearts. And so I'm gonna kind of combine those two things to speak about how we grow our faith so that it's not just for us, that God, you would provide for me, that God, you would settle me, that you would direct me, that you would protect me, that you would all the things for me, but that you would do it through me for someone else, that we would grow in our faith for someone else. And we know that hearing, or sorry, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so if we're gonna grow a people to be full of faith for others, we have to grow people who can hear God. So today, we are going to look at the Word of God. In order for us to do that, I'd love you to read. Grab your Bibles. This will be on the screen as well. But Matthew chapter 13, from verse 1 to 9, and then from 18 right through to 24. And I think God will bless you through these texts. You know, I, um, 
when I was at Varsity, a lot of the time for chemistry, they would get the master's students coming in to teach us. And the master's students, they're basically just a year further along, uh, and they were naughty. And so I remember them getting activators and like mixing sodium uh, hydroxide with potassium chloride or something, and you would throw it in together. They would say, just mix these two things in, and they'd, you'd put like this dollop of sodium chloride, I, I think it was, and the next thing you'd just have foam for days coming out. They would, and they would be killing themselves laughing. They, they were just having a jaw. But the truth is, the Word of God mixed with faith is so powerful that it can literally transform things. The word of God we know is able, it is so powerful that it can transform the world. It, it's by the word of God that the world was created. So when we're dealing with a force that powerful and we mix it with faith, we can start to see things created from nothing. That's really what the word of God is capable of. Hearing it requires faith and a soft heart. So in the text you read a little bit earlier, the, the writer, or Jesus, the speaker, is speaking about what faith in the word of God can do inside of your heart. And he says, he's basically saying, it can re reproduce him in you because Jesus, the word made flesh. So when we receive the word of God into a soft heart, which is actually a heart full of faith, not a heart full of doubt and hardness and skepticism and uh, just questioning everything. It's a heart full of, man, I believe you, Jesus. Man, I trust you, Jesus. A heart full of faith receives the word of God and reproduces within itself him. So, I want to ask you a quick question, then I'll dive into the next part. On the back of that text, do you personally need to have more seed sown, more word in you? Do you need to read the Bible more? Or do you need more heart plowed? Do you need your heart condition changed? Which is the thing that, if you're really honest with yourself, needs to change in your daily rhythm of life? Now, I know you guys are clever, so you probably caught on to the fact that they are one and the same thing, that uh, plowing the heart only happens because of the Word of God. It's when I look at the Word of God and I allow it to penetrate in, in the area of greed in my life, or I look at the Word of God and, and I allow it to penetrate in with love for enemies. And it's, it's when the Word of God like cuts me that my heart becomes plowed. And it's when my heart is plowed that I reorientate myself into a trust relationship with God. That's called faith. And by that, we receive. Now, I want to kind of shift a little bit into using the Word of God. Because if you are going to have the power of God work through you, you need faith, you need uh, the Word of God mixed together, so it's the soft heart and the Word coming together. And then you need to exercise it. And Jesus used the word again and again. So one of the things Jesus did is that he used the word of God to deal with opposition. When the devil came to him, he said three times, it is written, it is written, it is written. And in those it, it, it is written, he was quoting Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8. He was using the word of God to push back Satan. If you are going to Look after your home. Look after a family one day. Look after um, those who you love in your life. You need to have the word of God as a weapon to use against Satan, both for temptation and also when you're feeling like there's demonic activity in your home, in your, in your workspace, you need to have the word of God. Jesus used it on the enemy, on Satan. He used it on people. He was, in fact, if you page through the Bible, and every single one of those pages in the Gospels, almost every single one has conflict. Jesus had consistent conflict with his enemies and with people who wanted to prove him wrong. And he consistently used the word of God to deal with him. 
So he, used, he quoted from Hosea, from Genesis. He quoted from Deuteronomy 6. He quoted from Isaiah, from 29, 61. He quoted from Deuteronomy 17, from Malachi. He just kept reaching into the scriptures and using them to help people deal with what they believed about life, what they believed about God, what they believed about finances, what they believed about marriage, what they believed about family. He just kept on grabbing scriptures and using them to deal with conflict. The most impressive humans I know are people who can sit with you and you've got a business problem and they can just bring a scripture in to help you interpret it. See, the the Bible has to be used, and Jesus used it. He quoted it, and through using it, he, in effect, changed how people do life. We need the Word of God, and we need to be able to use it. He prophesied with it. He made sense of the world using the Word of God. He explained to people why they'd be hated. He explained to others what was happening in the world. He was just consistently reaching into the books like Daniel and pulling out prophecy to help people understand, understand the cross, understand what, what would happen to him, understand how the world would be changed by him. The question I want to ask you is, have you ever used scripture to deal with opposition? Opposition in a work context, in a home context, in the spaces that God's given you authority, the kind of environment that you want around you? Have you used it to bring correction to your kids? Have you used it to reshape your home culture into one of love? Have you used it to shift the enemy? Have you ever used the scriptures in conflict? Now part three, and uh, because I so want you to grow in faith, and I'm really trying to inspire you to uh, get into this word, because I know that if you read it enough, uh, what is basically logos, which is understanding word, will become rhema, which is a live word inside of us. But there's one more area that I really would like to challenge you, and that's your biblical worldview. You see, we live in a culture that um, is sexually charged, it's capital capitalism intense, so greed is a big issue. It's identity warped. It's integrity diluted. It is, it so bombards our soul. I heard one person say, pornography is the new wallpaper. It's like we're just bombarded left, right, and center with a cultural, cultural worldview. The biblical worldview is so much of the time completely opposed to the cultural worldview. But the question is, have you got a biblical worldview? So Paul quite consistently gives us a biblical worldview. For example, in Romans 1 and 2, he uses multiple texts from Proverbs and Psalms and the prophets to describe the depravity of man and what happens when you turn away from God as creator. And he outlines the, the effects that will hit our sexual identity and hit, hit our integrity and literally rip us apart if we turn away from God. In Romans 9 and 10, he describes how Christianity and Israel, Christianity will cross the entire world and then come to Israel finally before Christ comes back. And he helps us in that whole process understand the sovereignty of God and how he works all things for good. And he helps us understand the, the role of Christianity within the world to get to a certain place. And when we see certain things, we shouldn't get alarmed. He, he's giving us an entire picture, a worldview for how to interpret what's going on today. In 1 Corinthians, Paul quotes from Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Psalms to help us understand the effects of sexual immorality. He helps us understand greed, legal issues between Christians, and a sense of how to handle finances. All stuff that culture is bombarding us with. Now, here's my third and last question. Do you have a biblical worldview when it comes to things like Russia, 
versus Ukraine, global warming and catastrophic events, sexuality, gender fluidity or identity, racism, capitalism, communism and nationalism. Do you have an idea of what the Bible has to say about that? If you don't, here's what I encourage you to start. Start reading books that help us understand the world with the Bible. Because as we start to do that, you will find that you start to get settled. You know, the more knowledge you have, the less defensive you'll find yourself. And you'll find that you're able to both shape your own view and have fantastic conversations with people about Jesus. So, where are you at? How would you define your worldview when it comes to all these things? And what are you going to do about it? Are you going to shift? Because we want people who are so filled with the word of God that it comes out of them when we squeeze them. And I pray that you will hear God in the next season as the word of God gets swept over you again and again.